Hello and welcome to Liam's Lyceum, everyone. I'm your host, Liam, aka Hamvar, and today I am chatting with uh, another person. Uh, it's this way. The camera always messes with me. This is DJ Butler, who I'm chatting with today. He's the author of these books you see around us. So Liam, let's thanks see. for having me. Yeah, my my pleasure. Thanks for coming on, honestly. Uh, it's been... It was actually kind of funny because we kind of got a uh, set up in a way by uh, by Christopher Rocchio, who uh, you're friends with, I would say, and then I chatted with, of course, a couple weeks ago um, about his book when he was coming out with Kingdoms of Death and well and other things, of course. But uh, so, but actually, I've been reading your books longer than I have been reading Christopher's. Oh, so, fun. so yeah. So, anyways, so these books. If you look in the top left, I think, of this, and then top right, those are both witchy war books, right? So I have them yep. here, though I don't know if anyone can see them. Yeah. Um, I will say, honestly, the fourth, I put the fourth one on there because it's the latest one out, but it also has the best cover, um, <laughs> so, uh, in my opinion. Um, and so the first one would be, of course, Witchy Eye. This was not your first published book, though, right? You had a children's book, right? Yeah, and I had it depends on also on how you define publishing because I had I had self published and indie published. My first trad pub book was a children's book um, called The Kidnap Plot with Random House, and then this was my first adult sci fi fantasy novel. Yeah, that was okay. that was traditionally yeah. published. Okay, cool. I didn't realize you had done uh, like self publishing at all. Um, oh yeah, I have not read your uh, your middle grade stuff or whatever you call it. Um, that's published under the name David Butler, right? Dave, yeah. The Dave, Random House okay. contract dictates, specifies that Random House controls the name under which you get to publish. Oh. And they said Dave, and I said, well, okay. I already had stuff under the name DJ Butler. Uh, oh, okay. I don't know whether they wanted to distinguish their book from the other things, uh, uh, but fine. So functionally speaking, uh, this is not really a, a strategic choice, but functionally speaking, I write for kids under the name Dave Butler and then for adults under the name DJ. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you, do you go by Dave at all? Does I go by Dave, Dave almost always. Yeah. Okay. So Dave, okay. You don't go by DJ or David very often or. No, I started using the, the initials DJ because when I had my first agent, um, during the year in which I had my first agent, it became apparent at a certain point that uh, I was writing five times faster than he was willing to read my stuff. And so books were kind of piling up and I sort of tactfully pointed this out to him. He said, well, you should you should use that excess capacity to just start to self-publish. You can start driving readers that way. And I said, hmm. OK, so I, I came up with kind of like a self-published thing and, and started doing that um, at about which point he dropped me. Uh, but but uh, that's a project called Rock Band Fights Evil. And my initials are oh. DJ and DJ seemed like that was kind of like, I don't know. Um, and, but that again, that's sort of an accident. It just kind of stuck. Um, uh, funnily enough, I have. So I was going on a tour, uh, book tour to Seattle at one point and the local Seattle, I forget which one it was, but some kind of, you know, alt weekly event with an events calendar mentioned the reading uh, and, said, and said, come listen to a reading, uh, come listen to author DJ Butler read from her fantasy novel, uh, you know, which I, they, they assumed that the use of the initials meant I was a woman, so, which is fine. I have no objection to that, but it's just, none of it's deliberate. It's all kind of funny. I go by Dave. I'm sure. That is okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that is funny. Okay. Um, you know, these days I don't actually assume generally when people have, you know, their initials that they're a woman, but yeah, I guess traditionally in some ways that has been the case, but I yeah, mean, you think of, been... just thinking of Tolkien, right? Though, but he's been, you know, he used the initials even so. Right. Yeah. So, and now, and that would be my model. But it is true that some women, and for some periods of time, I, I think this is by and large not true anymore. Worried that having a woman's name on the cover would hurt sales in some genres i mean i think today if you wrote a romance novel an unabashed bodice ripper and you were a man and by the way i know lots of men who write those things okay 
you don't put the name Jim Hansen on the front. <laughs> you're not going to sell books. You, you know, you call yourself like you know, Cheryl Locklamore or whatever it is. Right, uh, of course. Got to use that pin name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I, uh, right, didn't, uh, didn't, um, Robert Jordan published a book under, uh, a pin name well robert jordan's pin name anyways but i mean uh, right a woman, yeah a woman's name he I may think. have i don't know that's an interesting question uh, but i but i've got um uh i guess i shouldn't out anybody but i know several writers who are currently you know men men who are today especially not exclusively but especially in the self-published indie space mm. where a lot of romance novels are published and consumed and you know they're putting out one 40,000 Highland romance or Western romance month, you know, under their female yeah. lady, lady pseudonym. <laughs> well, that's a uh, typical, I think for like, what are those? I've never read any, and I don't know if they still publish them, but were the Harlequin romances? Mm, yeah. yeah. Most of those were written by men, weren't they? But they all have women's pin names. I can't, yep. I think, I think I know I saw an interview with Ed Greenwood once, who's the creator for the forgotten realms. And he, actually admitted that he had written and published a harlequin romance once but he didn't say which one it was That's um awesome. so <laughs> my wife and i co-wrote a co-wrote a book as a ya uh, paranormal rant romance and uh my the guy in my writing group at the time said uh, hey i'll ask my daughter if she wants to read it and she said i'm not reading a romance novel written by a guy so <laughs> So when we pitched it, when Emily sent it out to get an agent, she she pitched it as just herself being the author and informed the agent after he picked her up. So <laughs> if it works, it's uh, do what you got to do, I guess. <laughs> there's a lot of that. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. OK, so Dave. OK, um, <laughs> um, well, that's cool. Um, I I read this. Yeah. Uh, I don't even remember when this was. It was whenever you were doing the tour for which you winter. Uh, so I don't know. Is that like 20, 2018 or something like that? Yeah, yeah, probably or about 18. 20, yeah, something something like that. I think twenty eighteen is right. I I know you were with uh with Chris Husberg. That's right. You were with uh Chris Ferracchio actually for a little bit of that as he. Uh, I think he came on the third. Have Chris Husberg done that four times? I think we've done it three times. And I think then the third one, Rocky, okay. Okay. I, I, I can't remember. I remember following the adventures on Twitter at the time, oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but that's been a while. So uh, the, uh, that was, yes. So Rocky, did you hear about the blown tire? Did we post that on Twitter? I, I don't remember hearing about it if you did. So. so this was awesome. We can't do one of these tours without some kind of car adventure. <laughs> uh, on, on one of them, we get pulled over by the state police in Washington. And there's a guy, the, the, the officer says, where are you going? And we say, well, we're, we write sci-fi fantasy novels. We're doing a book. Tour. He's like, oh, I love science fiction fantasy. Who do you yes. like to read? And he like talked to us for like 10 minutes about how much he loved Brandon Sanderson. And then he goes, let me, all right, let me go process this. And he's back at the car and we're like, well, surely we're going to get out of a ticket. No, that guy <laughs> brought a $120 ticket. Here you go. I was like, you jerk. We had to listen to you tell us about how much you like Mistborn and the Way of Kings, and then you still gave us a ticket. But but the best was Chris Chris Rocchio. Christopher Rocchio was driving, and we're driving to so about halfway through the tour. We're driving towards San Jose, um, and uh, and we're gonna get there, and he's gonna meet uh, a woman for lunch. Like like it's the it's a it's a woman because he knows because it's the mother of a good friend of his. He grew up knowing mm -hmm. her. This is like the neighbor lady from when he was a kid or whatever. And uh, and he drives over a nail and blows the tire, right? And uh, so we and we pull over and park in a Texaco parking lot or whatever. And he's so self-conscious and he's so embarrassed. And he's like, I blew the tire. I blew the tire. Not only did he blow the tire, but now I'm leaving because this woman's picking me up. We're going to go have a nice lunch somewhere where you guys have to sit here and deal with the issue. Um, so it was delightful, mostly because of how embarrassed Christopher was. Uh, and then awesomely, <laughs> it's tedious to explain why this is the case, but actually blowing the tire saved us like $400 on the car rental. 
because oh. they count, we could charge for mileage, but they didn't count any of the miles for the whole first half of the trip because they swapped out the car for us. So he saved us money by running over a nail. Is wow, the <laughs> nice. That's a very nice gray lining, actually. Yeah. Um, that's <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine him being embarrassed by that. Um, I mean, I would be honest too. So, <laughs> but uh, that's that's pretty interesting adventure, honestly. So, uh, was a uh, was that one was Empire Silence the only one he had had published at the time? Um, I think he was probably. So Husberg was like one book ahead of me. So I think if I was on book mm -hmm. three, Husberg was like on book four. I think that's right. And I think Rockio might have been like one behind, so maybe he was on book two. Yeah, I think he was reading because uh, the read. Yeah, because I'll tell you why the readings he was doing were from. Uh, it's that guy who's like, uh, who's who's like been through multiple bodies. Um, mm. uh, I forget his name, and uh, and 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 Marlo comes and encount encounters him on his like kind of cybernetic world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in book two, I'm pretty sure. He's he, that's the guy yeah. in the cover of book two holding the sword, right? Yeah, that's a uh, Sagara or Sagara, as most people I think. I don't know if Sagara is actually the way I know he based it off Japanese, so uh, Sagara is how I think of it, but it's probably right. yeah, Karn Saga Sagara or whatever. I don't know, yeah, so yeah, he is in book two, so yeah. Right. Well, that's pretty cool, honestly. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty cool adventure, it sounds like. Uh, but I know you've gone around a lot. To... I remember you used to be on like a quest to get to, like it seemed like every Barnes & Noble and, you know, put some signed copies of your books on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, prior to, I traveled a lot. So I'm a corporate trainer, and prior to 2020, that meant in mostly 90% plus in-person training, mostly in the U.S., Mm -hmm. uh and so i kept track uh and uh, barnes and noble before it went private again in 2019 or whatever every mm -hmm. year would publish how many stores it has so i would go well i've been to x number of stores that's y percent of your current existing stores uh and and then and they went private and stopped publishing the number and also like my job transformed into a zoom job um and uh but at that so at that time so i said okay i'm done i'm not gonna keep track anymore but i hit 46.1 percent of existing barnes and nobles and i would go on twitter and i would try and i'd needle the barnes and noble account i'd say look i'd, I'd tag them i'd be like here i am i, I am now i'm now at 44.2 i'm now at 44.6 of your barnes and Noble. don't you guys want to acknowledge that i'm the record holder they never responded Oh man, it, did you get? You're not on Twitter anymore. Did you get banned from Twitter or like? How did that... <laughs> My account got frozen. I I uh, I said so I I cracked a joke that Twitter didn't like. Twitter said you are threatening violence. I said well, clearly I'm not threatening violence. <laughs> they came back and said we have reviewed it. You are threatening violence. You must delete the tweet or you cannot be back. So I haven't gone back. Uh, it's been like two years. My account's there. I, I assume people oh. can see it. But it's if you look, I probably don't have a tweet since like mm, April or May 2020 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but I tell you what, if Elon Musk buys it, I think that's fascinating. I will probably go delete the tweet so I can be on Twitter again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sounds, sounds nice. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. Uh, I see a lot of, I follow a lot of authors on Twitter. Um, and you know, I, I, um, I think the best interaction I've gotten with authors has been on discord, which I don't know if Christopher's ever talked to you about it, but uh, I don't know. It's just nice. Um, it's kind of weird in a way. Um, just kind of chatting buddy, buddy with this, mm -hmm. this person that you want, you, you know, to sign your books for you or something like that. So, I mean, like but, <laughs> what discord servers cool. are you talking about? Um, so, discord, but they're like kind of small, like, Oh yeah, a random person would never wander in. It's like the Bane authors Discord or this, you know, so and so. Oh, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking. So like the one I met, um, Christopher. I don't know. I, was, I call him Rockio Christopher. I don't know what to call him. That's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, that I met um, the half mortal on or whatever. No. Um, he he's on Mike's books reviews um, Discord. Um, All right. But he's also on, I don't think it's one he runs. I think someone started as like a fan Discord for Sun Eater as a whole. He's on that one as well. Those are the only two servers I know of him on it. I'm also, I chat mostly with, they're kind of, uh, 
they're not like big authors, I guess, or anything, but uh, the Whetstone, Whetstone Sword and Sorcery Amateur Magazine Discord, which is a great Discord for chatting sword and sorcery and other like pulpy stuff. Um, Very cool. So on there, there's most of the people on there are actually authors of that type of stuff. So like Scott Odin, uh-huh. Howard Andrew Jones, yeah. um, uh, a lot of them, I'm forgetting a lot. The Cora uh, Buller to Brillair. I don't actually know how to say her name. She's a, uh, she's won Hugo Awards for, not for, well, for her blog, I think. But, um, and uh, yeah, just people like that. There's a lot of people like that on that one. So I like that server a lot. Um, but it's nice to yeah. know the chat, you know, with authors there too. Um, so interesting. I use it. Um... We had to figure out how to do tabletop gaming during uh, mm. during the shutdown. Utah did not ever have a very bad shutdown, but for a while you were really not supposed to go to people's houses. And uh, mm. some of our gamers are have various kinds of medical vulnerabilities, so we mm-hmm. we took that seriously. And um, so I used Discord, uh, tried other stuff. Roll twenty uh, kept malfunctioning for us. Had this weird quirk. There was one. Yeah. And it was the same guy where this happened more than once. The first time we went this whole six hour session and we only realized at the end that even though everybody else could hear him, I could not. Like like for some reason, Roll20 was not giving me his audio only to me, right? And so he just thought I was ignoring him the whole time. Nice. So <laughs> so, uh, so we, we still have remote guys. We usually Zoom for the audio and video, but we use Discord to like, you know, uh, drop graphic images or put a map in or write things like that. Uh, okay, yeah. I haven't used yeah. it like a social media network, more like just a private. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and it, it has the same kind of uh, failings of social media, that it, it addicting, and you could waste a lot of time on it, essentially, right? But, uh, um, but I mostly talk about books with people on there, and I've also used it for things like tabletop stuff, actually. So, uh, but mostly with my brothers, uh, and yeah, that's because yeah. they're far away, you yeah. know, and spread throughout the United States. So, um, yeah. it's nice, right? It's nice, you know, use it for that. Um, I wanted to say though, I I, I got a cunning man, oh, one from the Pueblo, uh, Colorado, Barnes and Noble. Awesome. So, uh, probably signed by both of us, then, right? I. Let me check. Double check. Yeah, so, it is. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Aaron and I went on tours because so sometimes if you find those at various places, maybe only Aaron has signed it, or maybe only I have signed it. Uh, but Aaron and I did a um, oh, how many signings did we do? Uh, we must have had like five or six signings in a loop, and I basically drove over and picked him up. He lives in the Denver area, okay. uh, and then straight down into. Um, New Mexico, uh, over into Arizona, uh, up to Vegas and backed up to Utah with, I think, five or maybe six signings along the way. But we hit every Barnes & Noble we could, right? So those Barnes & Nobles have books that have been signed twice. Nice. Uh, I felt, I felt, I was actually awesome. I was like, I, I think I had just moved there and I walked in. I was like, whoa, they have the Cunning Man on the shelf. I've been meaning to read this because I hadn't read it yet. I didn't have a copy. And so I was like, oh, look at that. It's signed too. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so that's the only time I've actually, that's not the only time I've seen an autographed copy at Barnes and Noble. It's the only time I've seen one of a book I wanted. Uh, so. so yes. And that's a, that is a great book actually too. I think it's interesting. It's like a, I always have a hard time describing it to people or at least in like two words or something. That's like, right. it's, you could call it rural fantasy, but as like a right. play on urban fantasy, but it's also right historical fiction right fantasy of, at the same time so right uh, plus urban yeah. fantasy implies some things that are not right i mean urban a state yeah. fantasy is, is a romance and there's like there's zero romance right like it's almost like the principal relationship plot is the son and the father right uh and the father sort of almost like has looks at a romance relationship and then it doesn't happen um yeah, I don't know. So it's a good question. This is a problem I have a lot, by the way. Like, I don't fit into easy buckets. Um, and uh, the result may be that I endure because I'm unique, or maybe because it may be that I die obscure because I don't, no one can understand. But um, yeah, so I, I go to like weird, uh, you know, like Dust Bowl fantasy. And that's not mm-hmm. quite right either, because it isn't the Dust Bowl, but that gives that kind of sense of like, great depression people are suffering you know yeah um 
or like historical occult detective. Um, uh, yeah, or, or Larry Korea. So the, the blurb on the cover, I think, says, or maybe it's on book two, the, the blurb from Larry, and it says something like, uh, uh, Hiram Woolley is the Grapes of Wrath meets the Dresden Files or something like that. Yeah, there we go. Jim, Jim Butcher, Butcher dropped yeah. the Grapes of Wrath. So the way that quote came about is the Bane editors are like sitting there talking about the season's worth of books. And and one of them says, oh, we should get this quote from someone. Let's email Larry and ask if he'll say it. Larry, will you say it? <laughs> God, I hear I say it. <laughs> oh, <man. clears throat> but that's pretty good, right? That's, that's a pretty good... Uh, it, yeah. You know, private detective wizard, but it is in the Great Depression. It is there is people are all down and out economically for the most part. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, I can't remember what what did you what was the I was I watched the video you did with um, Rocchio about a year ago or over a year mm -hmm. ago, um, and you said you had pitched Witchy Eye as like Game of Thrones meets. Oh man, what was it? Last of the Mohicans. Yes, the last of the Mohicans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I yeah. I said this verbally. I was, I mean, I put that in like the letters I was sending to, but I was actually in the, um, it was on the Strolling with the Stars event at Renovation, which is a the World Con in mm -hmm. Reno, circa twenty twelve, maybe, and uh, so I was deliberately there as one does right as one should you're an aspiring writer you go to events and you're like here's the five people i want to talk to and get to know you, you go with your list and you go after those people and tony weisskopf was on strolling with the stars which is a, a world con perennial event people with big names sign up and you can go take a walk in the morning for like two miles or a mile or something and so i'm in the i'm i'm standing there waiting for the start the thing to start and i'm Tony Weisskopf and a Bane editor, or I sorry, a tour editor, who I do not need to name, and uh, and I and they said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I write." What are you writing? I said, "Well, I got this fantasy novel. It's sort of like Game of Thrones crossed with Last of the Mohicans," and the uh, tour editor snorted, humph, and turned her back on me. <laughs> <laughs> but Tony eventually bought that book, so that's all right. <laughs> We're lost. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's funny actually, because well, yeah. Are all days with Bane? I think they are, right? Yeah. The, yeah. I mean, I also have uh, books with Wordfire Press uh, and Immortal Works, which are independent publishers. I have anthologies with others. Yeah. Well. Timeline. Uh, Hemeline, yeah, published my my collection. Uh, yeah, I also thought it was Heinlein the first time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a guy named Joe Monson, uh, who lives in Utah, who started putting together anthologies to benefit the life, the universe, and everything science fiction and fantasy writing symposium, and then started to branch out. So huh. he's uh, that's the first collection, he's got like two more in the pipeline, uh, where he's trying to collect the, sh the stories, short stories written by. He's calling it the corridor. It's sometimes been called the mm -hmm. Mormon corridor or the I-15 corridor, but it's the sort of north-south axis that runs up into Alberta and down mm -hmm. into northern Mexico. Um, so yeah, I'm Le Legends of the Corridor or something. I'm, I'm volume one. Yeah, yeah, it was something like that. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Legacy of the Corridor. Well, that's it. Legacy. That's there really it is. Yep. Hey. Yeah. So I thought that was a. I like. I haven't read everything in here, by the way. Oh yeah. I, do, uh, I told you this before in an email forever ago that I liked the use of flora legium or. Oh yeah. Say that. I don't know. So. Um, yeah, I have a plan. I have a scheme for the uh, the rest of the books. So I, so flora flora legium right literally means it's Latin. It means a binding uh -huh. together of flowers. It means a, a bouquet, yeah. right? But it's a but it's an old word that means a collection of texts. So it's just a synonym of collection or anthology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Uh, Ultimately, I want to live long enough and write enough that I have four of those volumes. <laughs> uh, book two to be called The Crestomathy of Desire. Uh, book three, The Palimpsest of Wisdom. And book four, The Argosy of Love. That's my plan. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Oh, About 25% of the way there. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I I await I eagerly await them. I don't know what a Christa Christomacy is. How you said <laughs> Christomacy? A Christomacy is. I probably have a book up there. A Christomacy is a collection of, literally, it means useful for learning. Christos is useful, and no. the Greek word root math, uh, like actually, it is mathematics, but it's to learn. Uh, it's a collection of texts useful for learning. So usually, a Christomacy is like, here are a bunch of texts in mm -hmm. Sanskrit, so the the learner can practice reading Sanskrit. But it means a collection okay. of texts again. Oh, that's cool. Okay, it's uh, almost like a Wolfian word. Uh, so. It is, yeah. Okay. Well, cool. I just wrote it down so I could use it later. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I like uh, I like using stuff like that. It's funny. Um, uh, I was telling Christopher when he was on that uh, generally, like my favorite authors are the ones I, I I emulate or really imitate or in some way imitate. I'm not like copying everything about it or whatever sure, sure, yeah. um, with writing. And right, and I had written a story around the time I I don't write a ton, but I, I never had anything published besides a poem. But um, I uh, I wrote a story that was based off my th my thoughts, at least how I view Rocchio and Wolf, because I had just um, Kings of Death and um, uh, sort of Lictor. Here, okay, sorry, say that again. <laughs> No, no worries. Uh, I I heard you. Your image froze, uh, but I heard you just fine. Okay. Okay. But I don't know See, if you I want to connections. Yeah. So I was just gonna say that I that's what I had re been reading at the time. I actually finished. So I am I am not caught up with Witchy War. I am about halfway through Serpent no Daughter right now. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I didn't think it offend you, but uh, <laughs> so, but uh, but yes, I'm getting there. Um, but um, I wrote some of a story around the time I had read Witchy I and Witchy Winter. I'm not really sure. Around that time, um, some of a story. I wrote like 2,000 words in a short story. Right now, All right. Cool. So, and uh, last week it was Thursday, I guess, or just a couple of days ago. I went back and I finished that story. <laughs> because I was reading Woo. Serpent Daughter. So I was like, hey, this this oh, awesome. inspiration, whatever. And so like um it's not the same. My world building is extremely subpar compared to yours, uh, just to be honest. So but it is it was kind of in that vein. It's a it's a historical fantasy set in 1993 France, actually. Um so which I don't know. Yeah, I just thought I'd let you know that anyways. <laughs> so that is very cool. I love it. Yeah, thanks for the inspiration. <laughs> but, uh, that's that's my thing. I like I always wear it on my sleeve. It's just like, oh, it, I wrote this story. Wasn't it obvious? I just finished reading some library or something. I mean, like, so <laughs> I think that's okay, at least for right now. But uh, so. no, we we all do that. Uh, we all do that. I I don't know. So when I was a kid, right? I I I read Tolkien, and mm -hmm. it was nineteen seventy nine. 80 something like that uh and um uh no no yeah like like 80 81 so uh and and i loved i loved it and i wanted to go read more and and it turned out that actually like my reaction read tolkien there must be more of this is basically the reaction of a whole generation of fantasy writers there are a lot of books that people just straight out produced their Tolkien homage and that started their literary career. Uh, that That is Terry Brooks. That is the sort of Shannara. Uh, Stephen R. Donaldson's Chronicles of Thomas Covenant is like, you know, one of the attempts to be an anti-Tolkien, as is Michael Moorcock's mm -hmm. uh, Elric books. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, that's very, that's, that's, that's just how it goes. That's, that's part of the deal. That's good. Texts are supposed to communicate to each other across space and time. Yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah. It's a... Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. That's just me being a little self-conscious. Um, but, but so, um, it's it's funny you mentioned, uh, I think I... I don't know if I mentioned it with my chat with Christopher, but I mentioned that I... He, he mentioned actually something I went and read afterwards, and that was the best introduction to the mountains. And I was like, way better than Epic Pooh. Um, no, but, um, but, uh, that made me, you made me think of it actually, cause you mentioned like the sort of, uh, Shannara, which is r really heavy on the imitation 
and that's yeah. fine. Yeah, and that's kind of what Wolf talks about in um, the introduction of the mountains. Is the image is fine, right? And uh, um, I didn't. I, it's funny, I actually. I did not enjoy the Sword of Shannara, though. Like, uh, <laughs> like, but I did really enjoy Elf Stones and Wish Tong, and I haven't read any more right. yet. But right, so. that's really where he finds himself. And there's there's a story in there. Um, apparently, when Brooks turned in his second book. Lester Del Rey, I think that's who the editor was, mm -hmm. kind of said, all right, nope, now I need to teach you how to actually write a book because you're just imitating yourself. And and wrote him this really long editorial letter that basically said, you got to go back and do it over again. Here's all the stuff I want you to think about. It. And then he produced Elstow, which I think is a much better book. I think Shannara, when I was a kid, I just loved it, but I was just, it was mm -hmm. just, it is Tolkien. Let's now go under the mountain. We have an elf and a dwarf and a character named Durin. And like it is Tolkien. <laughs> and these, you know, guys from Shady Vale, which is just like Hobbiton, but they're taller, right? Like it is the Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Um, we have a druid. He behaves a lot like a wizard. Uh yeah. Um, he, he really finds his own. I I, I there's a lot of Shannara now, uh, like 30 some books, I think. Yeah. Um, I, I the of what I've read, my favorite are remain L Stones and Wish Song. I, I oh think really? That's cool. huh. it's interesting. Yeah, I do plan on reading uh, getting the Heritage at some point. I think is that the, yeah. yeah, I think Heritage was called. I think that's right. I haven't read them all. Right. Yeah. So it, it's always it's interesting to me though because it's like uh, I. I always when I, when I think of the Sword of Shannara, it's actually generally the other way around. I think people will mention this book because it's a little bit more popular these days, and it's the the Eye of the World, and oh, yeah. like it's just a big Tolkien ripoff. I was like, I mean, have you read the Sword of Shannara? <laughs> but I mean, um, so, but uh, um, I think it's fine, right? I mean, like even in Terry Brooks' case, where it's it's to the point where you could call it a ripoff almost, right? I mean, like. Um, something like the eye of the world is way more in my opinion more of a homage or something like that rather i mean like i don't know it seemed like more original enough when i was reading it. i wasn't a big fan of, eye of the world either but uh but so but yeah. or uh wheel of time as a whole actually to be honest but uh but uh had its moments um so but uh i actually uh wanted to mentioning wolf maybe think of oh, this yeah. book a little bit um oh yeah lighting is really bad um, but uh, so, but uh, in the Palace Shadow, which I believe you're working on the second novel, is that... All right, I'm pointing at the the cover is also between us in the background. There's that, right? Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So what I'm doing right now is uh, so there are ten published short stories about these two characters, which amounts to seventy one thousand words. And this last week, I finished a novella of 24,000 words, which will together make basically book two. And I also am on the very edge of finishing book three. So I have, so I should finish that this week. Um, and uh, then I got to figure out how it's going to be published. Maybe, maybe Bain will keep publishing these or maybe there are other publishers. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. But yeah, so basically a two and a three ought to come out in the next year or so. Awesome. <laughs> I look forward to that. I, uh, I always, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of like Vance's Dying Earth meets mm -hmm. Liber's Link Mark yeah. stuff. Um, so, yep, which is okay yeah. by me because I love both those. But uh, so. yeah, it's got that kind of buddy comedy, right? Vance uh -huh. or, or Liber's guys are both swordsmen, and um, mm -hmm. and apparently, I forget exactly who, uh, but I read an essay where he said, uh, where the the writer of the essay said. Um, the the city of Lankmar is New York, and it's it's the city that it's where Liber lived, and I forget there like there's another guy like Liber is the Gray Mouser, and there's some other guy who was Fawford, uh, and it was sort of you know uh, like his own his own life and his I don't know I don't, can't forget can't remember who the you know this other relationship kind of inspired these series of books, um, uh, so I've got a I. I that's not the case for me. These are not these these <laughs> characters are not based on me, right? But in a way, they are they are based on Fawfer and the Gray Mouser. But Fawfer and the Gray Mouser are both swordsmen. These guys are both sort of uh, intellectuals, right? Although ni neither one would use that word. Um, but uh, but yeah, Indrajit is the is the epic oral poet of a dying people, 
uh, who was looking for a way to continue. So he's like he's like the ancient bards who composed and recited the Iliad, right? Mm -hmm. He had all these um, epic epithets and uh, memorize it, and there there are like gestures that go along with it, and acting and and intonation. Um, and uh, and he and he's come to the big city because none of the youth who live, you know, there's only a few hundred people. Uh, no one wants to continue the poem, and he, he his obligation is to preserve it. So he's looking for an apprentice. Uh, and and by the way, uh, his people and his of course calling reject literacy. So he's he's not just illiterate. I mean, he's anti-literate. Uh, he's stubbornly an oral person of an oral tradition, um, and and no one values what he does in in this big dirty uh former imperial capital but now it's now the whole thing is uh sort of thoroughly cynical thoroughly corrupt the city's built on multiple layers of old former versions of the city so like the whole mound is hollow and ruins and rot um no one cares about <laughs> the poem. so he's sort of making a living barely as a thug uh and gets put together with this other guy who was sort of making a living barely as a thug who uh was raised um he was an orphan he was he was um uh fostered by uh, he doesn't use this word but monks in a monastery uh uh worshipers of a god called salish bozar the white uh, as a god of useless knowledge <laughs> and, uh, and he rejected the idea of useless knowledge when he fell in love so he's out the woman he fell in love with is married and mm -hmm. has abandoned him, but he's still out there trying to sort of use knowledge to make his way uh, in, in the world. So he's a, uh, it's kind of a bard and a rogue uh, buddy comedy. It's the novel is to a very large degree banter driven. Um, they're constantly picking at each other in the way good male friends sometimes really do. Uh, and, uh, it's about them getting set up to be the patsies in this kind of insurance fraud and murder scheme. Yeah, <laughs> it's a. Uh, I actually do have a review for it on my channel. Um, but, oh, cool. Uh, um, and I've read a couple of the short stories. I've read Sacrifices. So it was on oh, yeah. the website. Yep. And I've read the one that was in Sword and Planets. So Power and Oh yeah. Power and. Wait, yeah, yeah, that's where they meet uh, Munahim, the dog-headed guy. Yeah, that was that was awesome. By the way, that's that's one of the best short stories I've read in the, recently. So, I, mean, that was, yeah. um, I thought that was that's cool. a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's very kind. Um, so, yeah, well, there's eight more, and they'll be in a they'll be in a book. I don't know, in a yearish, <laughs> maybe less. All right, looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, and that's not that's not light praise. I mean, because I do read. I mean, like. Uh, when libraries are mostly short stories, I, I do have uh, this is the next one, obviously, I have to get to for library, and that is a novel, I guess, technically, it's the first one oh, yeah. of the Lankmar yep. books. So, Swords of Lankmar, uh, so that'll be interesting, but um, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's nice. Uh, also, this is a Don Mates cover, isn't it? It is, yeah, Don Mates, so. who, who did the covers of the uh, I think sort of current basically editions of Book of the New Earth um right they're published i can't remember is it delray who published them and there's like it's the it's one and two and, is it is it maybe uh and it's a very different style so they told me dunmates was doing the cover i thought i imagine it was gonna be like that <laughs> where it's a little more kind of abstract and almost like uh -huh. a little classical maybe mm -hmm. um and and this is the cover kit is more like a kind of an 80s fantasy cover more like a daryl k suite Mm -hmm. Kind of, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, probably most famous for his having uh, designed and painted the label for Captain Morgan uh, rum. Uh, oh, did he? I, I think. Oh, yeah. Like I did not know uh, that. <laughs> like a Don Mates, and they do the little Captain Morgan pose where you lift one foot up on a barrel like Captain Morgan, wow, and okay. hand on a dip and holding. Maybe he's holding a cutlass or something. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, okay. so yeah, that I, I covered yeah, that. I know. I know him from those uh, the wolf books, right? Or the Book of the New Sun stuff. But uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool cover. Honestly, I think your covers. I, I, if I were, can just come out and say I don't like most of Bane's covers. Mm. 
Um, at least their current ones. I don't know what's going on there. Um, I mean, like some are good, like uh, th- those uh, anthologies that uh, Rocky was edited, like Sword and Planets and Time mm-hmm. Troopers and whatnot. Those are great. Um, those are are those both Kieran Yanner, I think. Then you have DeSantos, who does yeah. you know, War books, which I know you've pointed out that this is not really how Sarah looks in a way. Um, yeah, but, uh, she's, but she's they're home. great covers. <laughs> yeah yeah they are amazing covers uh yeah the so it, and dan's a great guy he, he emailed me before book one and said hey well, you know i read i read the book you have any ideas for a cover and i had all these ideas i was like man mm-hmm. you know one cool thing is like there's a tarot deck that's really big what if we did a well what, what if there was like a portrait of the main character in the style of a tarot card uh, or I said, also, you know, there's an iconography of saints. There are a lot of these sort of new world saints, characters we know mm-hmm. from history, um, like Robert Rogers, who are who are saints. What if we do her an icon of her as a saint? He totally ignored me. Uh, he right. just did. He just did his thing, <laughs> uh, which has been true every time he and I have talked about covers. He's like, oh yeah, and then he does something else. <laughs> oh, well, but he, I'm okay. very lucky. Yeah. Uh, I'm 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 lucky. Now I will okay, so I'll tell you this though, right? There's a there's a cost. There's a risk and a cost to everything. There, this is a mm-hmm. world of trade-offs, right? So I was at Dragon Con one year standing at a at a big booth of books, and a guy came up and and walked around the table and he literally picked up every Bane book that was on the table. Bam, 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 bam. Walked right past mine, didn't look at it. Oh. And I actually think it's because they don't look like Bane books. Really? Uh, you have to pick it up. And I look guess they don't, mind. yeah. They don't. They really don't. So that's funny. That's wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of sad, but, <laughs> but uh, yeah. so if I had those like big orange covers, right? Like I might have got the sale. It's like, what's this random book doing in the Bain section? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's oh, uh, that's that's interesting. Um, <laughs> um, this is off topic, but uh, I did remember actually something you mentioned. Uh, Fritz Leiber's friend was Harry Otto Fisher. And, oh, I think uh, that's right. That's I couldn't. Right. I didn't actually know that. I knew they were based off of like Foffer was based off one of them, and Ray Master was based off one of them. I could. I never knew because I don't. I don't know what they look like. You know. And uh, right. Fisher <clears throat> wrote almost nothing for the world of Nalon, right? Like he wrote, he wrote ten thousand words in the Lords of Quarmall, which is in Swords Against Wizardry, and I. I don't even know how long that is. So I don't know what chunk of that is. I mean, it's a novelette. So, I mean, I guess it's a decent chunk at least. Um, but, uh, and then he also wrote, I don't even remember what it's called, but it's like a couple page introduction to the Gray Mouser that is in oh, Dragon right. Magazine 18. Oh, uh, how funny. I've probably read that and didn't realize that's the connection. Yeah. It's, he wrote it like way later. Um, obviously, it's Dragon Magazine. Um, and so, I mean, like, and, uh, he wrote it because he wasn't happy with, um, is it the Unholy Grail, I think, is Liber's introduction to the Grey Mouser in Swords and Devil Tree? He wasn't happy uh, with it, or 100% happy with it. And so he was like, I'm going to write stuff before that, essentially. So it's like, even when Mouser, before he went to apprentice with that uh, hedge wizard, I don't remember his name. Uh, um, so yeah, it's fun. Um, so uh, yeah, there's that. Um, but I think that's it. I think that's he, he, but he was the one who actually, I think, had the idea for the characters. You know, that he's like, but base his characters are for friendship type of thing. I think it was his. I'm not sure on that. But yeah. So uh, I forever I, ago. So, all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think your reading is more current than mine. I'm remembering from what I read, you know, 15 years ago, and you're going through them now. So I, that's very good. Um, interesting. It's uh, It's been some of my favorite. A library has become a favorite of mine, honestly. Um, I've uh, so I've read the first four offering great master things, and then read gather darkness which is like a 40s sci-fi kind of kind of fancy thing going on there uh there's this awesome lightsaber duel in in the book actually uh which is cited as potentially one of the inspirations for lightsabers in star wars um very cool but it's only like a paragraph long but you know liber was a was a fencer you know so it is really awesome uh, but so yeah uh, so anyways uh that was that was the thought that you were talking about earlier um but yeah, it's, that's man, that's funny, honestly, because I I love these covers, I really do. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very, I'm very. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and they, I remember there was like two options for this one uh, originally. He had like done two pieces, I think, for Witchy Kingdom, and uh, usually he does four. I think, oh, okay. I think there are four. Yeah, I remember seeing and the I second have, one at least, but 
Yeah, I haven't seen them all. Uh, sometimes they mail them to us, or, or, or sometimes he emails them. So I got a few, but they're uh, they're sort of like, "Hey, Dave, just for your enjoyment, don't share mm-hmm. this around," kind of thing. Okay. Uh, and in a few cases, in a few cases, I think early versions, early drafts when the final isn't ready, get used for posters. So here and there you can find promotional posters that are um, mm-hmm. usually not the alternate cover, but like the sketch version of the one that did get chosen. And I was looking around because I, I don't think it's here. It's upstairs. I've got the, the cunning man. I've got a, a cunning man poster like that. That is, that is the draft. That's fun to look oh. at that and see the difference. That's pretty cool. He did, the, he did the Cutting Man ones too. It's the same guy, Dan Dos Santos. Yeah, yeah. I was I was looking at that actually. I think I prefer the Jupiter Knife one over the Cunning Man, personally. Yeah. Well, I think the idea of the the Cunning Man one's cooler. I mean, look at that. That's cool. He's hovered, he's levitating over a hat. Um, yeah. <laughs> the thing about that cover, right? The Cunning Man is like in all of its details, it's completely wrong. Um <laughs> But it captured the spirit of the book in like an amazing way I wouldn't have thought to. So, for example, like he never levitates like that. That's just not right. the kind of thing. So, <laughs> and nor do we ever see him like setting the hat on the plowed field. And in fact, really, it's not about a place where they plow. It's about a place where you have mines and and railroads. So like mm-hmm. nobody's plowing. Um, and, and also, it's not flat like that in Kansas, right? It's a bunch of red rock ridges. Um, so like... And 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 it's, it's all wrong, but it, but it's perfect. Uh, it really captures, you know, because he's standing, he's perpendicular to everybody else, mm-hmm. right? He's like at a ninety degree angle, he's, he's he's not he's opposed to the world. It's like he's just at a completely, he's he's at an oblique angle to it. And I uh, like I like his hair too. He's it's the hair again. The hair's wrong. He's supposed <laughs> to be basically balding. Like one of his characteristic yeah. gestures is he'll he'll raise his hat. And this is the fedora I got. I, I wear hats to celebrate different characters. This is the this is my Hiram Woolley fedora fedora. But he'll he'll raise his hat and run his fingers through his hair, right? Does this a lot. Um because his his, his hair is thinning. Uh and the the cover, he does not have thinning hair. Uh in fact, what he has is a Superman curl. Right, he has a curl mm-hmm. of hair yeah. over his forehead, like Christopher Reeve, like the classic Superman comic strips, and and again, it's totally wrong, except that it's awesomely perfect because that sort of morally, he is that guy. He he is, he's mm-hmm. he's really you know he's really good. He's like a really good hero. He's he's like a Boy Scout. You know, he he he's out there fighting in the world, trying to help the poor, you know, the orphans and the fa- and the and the widows of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love both those covers. I do. Uh, the high, the, the first one was just very striking. It was like, wow, this, this is wrong, but perfect. <laughs> it's funny how that works, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed those books. I read them. I think I read the Cunning Man in like one day. Um, I mean, not very long. And, uh, I don't read a lot of urban fantasy i guess if you want to call it that i i i lived in utah i, I mentioned it before for a couple of years um yeah. i've stayed the night in price before i think the first mm-hmm. book is in helper isn't it i mean yep. um i have not been to moab but i've driven on was that 70 it is yep okay so driven on 70 uh, a couple of times um so through that area um, great books and i love hiram woolley i've read i've read one of his short stories the the first one in here, it's seven seven nipples of Molly. Seven Kitchen. nipples of Molly Kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm actually uh, I have a few things to say about Hiram Woolley, but um I'm curious because it is it's co-written with mm. Aaron Michael Ritchie. How do you do that like process yeah. actually? Um, so the process is uh, it basically went this way. So um, so first of all. I w- w- where the idea came from was I hold these writing retreats at my house every spring. Like it literally mm-hmm. actually ended today. I, I just got back an hour and a half ago from driving the last guy to the airport. So a bunch of writers show up in my house for a week. We had like eight people here, you know, uh, it's a big old sprawling piece of junk house. Everyone's sitting in a corner for a week in a chair writing away. So we were, we were at this event, I don't know, four or five years ago or something. And, and uh, I don't know how the idea came up. But we, but somehow we started sort of saying, you know, hey, we should, 
sugar beet farmer in the 30s who's also a wizard and originally we talked about it with this very pulpy kind of like mm. uh titles like indiana jones movies right hiram woolley and the sword of laban hiram woolley and the, right that was kind of where we were going with this um and and i said okay listen when it's time for me to pitch books to bain i'll pitch this i said there's no way they're gonna go for it but but i'll pitch it um so the time came and I wrote five pitches and I sent them to Tony and she kind of discarded a couple of them said, give me more detail about these. And I called Aaron and said, well, believe it or not, we're still in the running. So we got to figure out more detail. So we, we did that and went back and she knocked out another one and said, give me more detail about this. And, and then like she chose Hiram Woolley. <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, so we had to write it. Um, so, um, Basically, there's about as much work in the outlining as there is in the writing. If the, if, the, if the outlining and editing together is honestly more work than the writing. So uh, we started with, and we, there's a spreadsheet we used to do this, and and it's it's actually based on screenwriting, but it has about like twelve or fourteen kind of major beats in a Hollywood movie, and you kind of go through and say, well, the, the, you you populate the spreadsheet with how many? What's the word count in my book? aimed at and it will tell you here's approximately where act one needs to end and you should state your theme here right so we started with that super high level let's get some ideas out move to outlining we got an outlining that's i don't know an outline it's a spreadsheet it's probably five or six columns times uh i think 40 chapters so we decided it was going to be 40 10 page chapters in the editing i think it ended up being 39 because we sort mm -hmm. of had to do some stuff but so for each chapter, we we said, OK, you know, chapter number one, whose point of view is this? Where where does this happen? What are the main events of the plot? What are the main uh, events or beats relating to some plot? Um, what are uh, um, I think I had two more columns. We definitely had a column that said, like, what magic should we put in here? We might have had a column like what horror or suspense should be in here, too. And we basically spent a month having one to two hour phone calls every day with this Google sheet in front of us, right? So we could both type in the same time, populating this outline. Uh, and then we added a column to say, okay, who's going to write this chapter? And um, Aaron, Aaron came out to visit me. He lives in Colorado. I live in Utah. We were going to, we were going to start. And I picked him up from the airport. Like, I think it was Sunday evening. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, uh, he said, all right, this is fun. We'll, we'll go to your house. We'll relax. We'll think about this tomorrow. We'll start. I said, no, starting, starting is the hard part. We start tonight. We're going to write the first two chapters tonight. Huh. And so we went back to the house, said hi to the family, wrote the first two chapters. I wrote chapter one. He wrote chapter two. Uh, huh. And then we just kept going and we wrote that we wrote the draft in like nine days. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and it was about, he was there about five, then he went home and then we, four days later, we we're done. We had a book um, and we took the, the, these, you know, 20 chapters he'd written and the 20 chapters I'd written and stuck them together like piano teeth, black and white keys. And like 95% it worked. There were a couple of places where we had both at the overlap point, we'd both written, like there was a duplicative scene because mm -hmm. he, he met them meeting the thugs or he wrote them meeting the thugs and i also wrote the meeting the thugs and so we had to like but basically <laughs> that worked and then we you know did three editorial passes you know i do a pass he'd do a pass i do a pass hmm. send it in so you know all told it's like about two months and we wrote a book yeah wow nice <laughs> yeah it's uh seems impressive to me i don't i don't i'm the longest thing i've ever written is like slightly less than 10,000 words <laughs> so i mean you know that's depending on the novel that might be a quarter of a book mm -hmm. yeah true i guess yeah <laughs> but just times that by four or ten or twenty depending on yeah your consistency is my thing which is why i've only really finished short stories i write a lot of poetry too but like you know stuff mm -hmm. like that so i know you actually you write music don't you <laughs> i do yeah pretty cool i remember i watched i don't remember what it was it was some event last year and there was a stream for it i remember i was on the stream and oh yeah with your guitar actually is this the one where the guy showed up with uh no pants on i don't 
I don't remember someone with no pants. <laughs> that happened in one event. I was at Fantasy last year, and I did a concert, and I didn't really. Um, I guess I'd never had the any any the experience of anyone bombing like a meeting, so I didn't think about it. But somebody got a hold of the URL, jumped in with a with a not dressed image of himself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so that happened during a during a zoom concert i did uh wow <laughs> yeah, people, people are weird yeah <laughs> odd odd cookies out there okay uh that's, uh, exactly. um, that's wow okay and i don't i didn't see that picture i'm glad it but i saw i don't know if that was yeah know, you didn't you didn't need but... to see that that doesn't <laughs> <really at all. laughs> didn't help didn't help the concert at all, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's funny. So yeah, I put it. songs in my books, and I and I go yeah. to um, uh, sci-fi fantasy conventions, and I and I perform. Yeah, I'm not good. I'm just Marley. unafraid of being bad. Well, that's uh, admirable. <laughs> um, I uh, I was gonna say, you know, it's um. Uh, words hi I'm woolly actually it's interesting because i you you sent me you were very kind enough to send me a copy of avid in darkness and uh john reminds me a decent amount of hiram from the cunning man or well the higher woolly series rather whatever um and so um which i thought was pretty interesting it was actually uh he's a he's I mean, right, because he's a good guy and, like, the, uh, largely, well, not completely, but there's a lot of corruption around him and, you know, lawlessness in some senses. I almost looked at it as, a, like, a West, a Western. I don't read a lot of Westerns. I don't know if that's what you're going for. But um, uh, but it was nice. It was really nice. It was interesting. And I, I made I made a really short Goodreads review. I'm, I am going to re record a review, actually. I, I haven't recorded it yet. It won't come out until, like, next week probably. But um, thank you. And uh, it was just interesting because you made an accountant family man have like an actual suspenseful and action filled book. And it's not, he's not just an account family man. It's not like he's Superman, you know, and he just goes and guns blazing or something like that. He, he, like right. the point I think he made is that he'd rather talk to people. You know what I mean? Like, and he wants peace rather than, you know, discord or whatever you want to call it. So um, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So Abbott is a, um, so your point about the American West is a perceptive one. That's a good one. So it, it is, it is fundamentally an age of sale story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and fundamentally the, the story is about, and I think this is likely as we become, if we leave our solar system, I think it's likely that we're going to at some point find ourselves in this situation um, where, um, where we have travel between worlds, between systems, but it's not instantaneous. It takes a mm -hmm. long time, right? And um, that was that was the situation at the beginning of the, the modern age when we had the rise of these big commercial companies, the East India Company, uh, right? The, the Muscovy Company, the Hudson Bay Company, all these others. Um, and, and, uh, so in particular thinking about the East India company, right? What you had was a, uh, the government chartered, the government says, okay, you can have a company, right? We didn't really have corporate laws as such at the time. So the, the, the queen, uh, would, would charter Queen Elizabeth charter the East India company. And, um, and it's a commercial enterprise and it has profit incentives, right? Mm -hmm. But, but it's, where the field where it's going to act is so far away from the queen and her officers that basically they act like the government. So you, you, you become, you have an army, right. And, and ships and cannon and technological advantage over the people who live there. Uh, mm -hmm. And you go there and, and, and really you're not, you, what you're supposed to be doing is trading, but you end up conquering and building forts and, and exploiting. And and the East India Company is is specifically is the model, right? Because the the um, the British and the Dutch went east for spices in the first instance, um, and uh, but but when they got to India, one of the things they found was fabric, and it is the case that a lot of our words for fabric, like muslin and calico, uh, come from 
come from words given to different kinds of fabric we were buying from India. Uh, they still come from this, right? So, uh, uh, and, and these people were highly developed. They were making these amazing fabrics, but they didn't have the cannons and the guns. And Britain had was having, you know, a, a boom, in, a demographic boom and a bunch of young men to export. And, and so we ended up, look, the, the East India Company is not is not 100% a sordid tale. There are bright moments. There are people who go out there mm -hmm. and try hard to be good. Um, and there is some real awful stuff. And, and by the way, you could probably say a very similar thing about the Dutch companies and about the Russian companies. And right there, there's a there's a there's a conflict intrinsic in that situation where you, you give people who have only a profit motive and uh, basically um, you give them sovereign like powers over a territory. So so that's kind of the background. Right. So there's this there's this um, humans have met other species. Uh, John has seen some of them. He had a professor uh, who was a non-human, right? But humans' only real toehold beyond Saul is there's a is there's a worm hole out uh, near Jupiter, and it, it leads to a this system forty light years away, which is six months of travel, um, uh, which is which is called Sarovar, and that is a that is a. That's a name taken out of the Mahabharata. This is very deliberate. This is a, an allusion. There are several references in the text to the, the sort of East India Company um, background. But, but, but you're not the first to sort of say Cowboys and Indians, American Frontier. And the reason is it's basically the same dynamic. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing the right. same, same thing, right? Um, so uh, yeah, John. John's a good guy. John. John is he's a young guy. He's getting out with his you know degree in accounting. Uh, married young. His wife's he's he's sort of an agnostic. His wife's pretty devout. A uh, couple of young kids. Debt. This job is great. The best thing about the working for the company, and this again, this is taken straight from the the East India Company, is they would let their traders trade for their own account. That was the real secret to getting rich. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that or like robbing uh -huh. a local king, right? Which some of them did. But 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 trading for your own account meant you took your your savings or your you know your father's savings and you went and you you bought calico or muslin and or silks and you came back and sold them uh in Britain and made a big profit. You got rich trading, your salary was small. Um yeah. and that's the lure here, but it turns out John gets there and 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 uh and people are corrupt. People are people, right? And uh, some people are kind of ordinarily corrupt, cheerfully benefiting from some of the inequities. Fine, right? What some people are really corrupt uh, and willing to kill. Uh, and John, who and this is you're exactly right. People go, you know, Larry Korea. Oh, Monster Hunter International isn't about an accountant. Well, yeah, sort of. It's about a guy who knows a lot about guns and shoots a lot of guns, but also is an accountant, right? <laughs> Uh, John Abbott is really an accountant. <laughs> he's, mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's got a genetic, um, a condition, uh, called Marfan syndrome, which is, which is really flexible because, well, weak tissues, connective tissues. Uh, and that means, uh, he, he's described as being goofy looking, uh, but he can, he can bend his fingers back really far. At one point he does this kind of party trick where he folds mm -hmm. all his fingers and, puts them all the way to touch the bottom of a fluted wine glass, which a person with ordinary ordinary levels of flexibility can't do. He can. He's got Marfans. But it also means he's very vulnerable to a violent shock. Uh, and so he's not, a, he's not a man of action. He's not there to punch people, to get into fights, to, to get into gunfights, uh, right? He, he didn't go, he didn't go, or he, well, they discover his condition when he is uh, applying to join Space Force. Mm-hmm. And it's a mistake. It should have been corrected in utero, but the you know the hospital didn't catch it. No one realized anything until you know he's eighteen years old. What are you going to do? So yeah, he wants to. He yeah, he wants to talk. He wants to negotiate. He wants to get to an outcome that is good for everybody who's willing to negotiate. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's a lot of. Uh, um, so it's different from a lot of sci-fi fantasy that way. John doesn't want to shoot the bad guy ever. 
Uh, he might yeah. have got to go to prison. That's different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's a, yes, he's kind of like Batman, but uh, no, he's kinda like, from the little Batman, I know I don't really know comics that well, but um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, no, that's, it's funny though, because it's also cool though, because there's this cool dynamic with what the natives, the natives are these aliens, but there's also these people that have been there before the Sarvar company took over, which uh, there's some questions left unanswered yeah. there. It seems like at, by the end of the book, um, which yeah. was really intriguing. And uh, I, some I of them are convinced they've been there for a long time. Mm-hmm. Whereas the company's official record is that a couple of kind of colonizing ships came through about the same time the company did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Very interesting. I, that actually reminds me of a question I had uh, that I don't know um, the answer to, obviously. Um, but uh, is uh, with um, where did I put the book? Oh, it's right here. Uh, with this, with Indrajit, is that how you said it? Indrajit. Uh, Indrajit. Indrajit. Okay, I always said Indrajit. But uh, um, it's all good. Um, is this on Earth? <laughs> it is Earth. Yeah, it's a far okay. future Earth um that is made been made unrecognizable by time and also um by an intervening gene war no one remembers the gene war as far enough back mm. that that there that, that or at least nobody we've met remembers the gene war but the reason that in that setting there there is a proverbial there are a proverbial thousand races of man uh is because at one point uh, a bunch of races of humankind were created to serve various functions in a war, uh, and, uh, and and so so. Although Fritz Leiber is a great is, is a huge influence, and by the way, Happen Leonard was kind of another uh, influence. This that whole buddy comedy kind of dynamic. Um, there's another influence, which is uh, Star Wars, and specifically the Mos Eisley Cantina. Um, <laughs> And and one way to think about Kish, the city of Kish, which is a real, Kish is a real earth name. It's a very Mm -hmm. old name in human history. So there's this, there's a Sumerian city called Kish and the name is one that pops up in other sometimes surprising places. But uh, the, uh, another way to think about it is it's the most likely cantina blown up to the size of a city because you have people who have like, like in the novella I just wrote, there's this wizard who's got a kind of a walrus head and his right hand is a big flipper. Uh, and and he's this big ogre-sized, you know, wizard. Uh, or you have people who are, you know, s- small and lavender-colored with long snouts. Or uh, Munahim, when Indrajit and Fix finally mm-hmm. pick up a third guy. Um, which the way that's going to work is that's kind of about three quarters of the way through book two is basically when this happens. But he sticks around. He's in he's in like two stories and a, a um the novella and then he's also in book three he's got a dog's head he's like he's a tall muscular man with the head of a like a dog (laughs) and uh uh and some dog kind of instincts uh so uh and and that all goes back to a deliberate genetic tinkering with humankind so yeah it is earth um and um nothing like yet specifically recognizable like oh we're riding down the beach and there is a statue of a woman with a torch submerged. Right, yeah that, that <laughs> hasn't happened I'm not saying it never will uh but yeah yeah that's uh it's just interesting because like it was a question of mine because like i've read um some of vance's dying earth and then i've read the book of the new sun by wolf and uh those seem to be like far future earth right of course hence the genre name um or in vance's case hence the name of the book but um and uh but you don't you can't really ever recognize it um there's i don't really remember any hints of it in the vance i've read maybe there's like hints that are like so muddled because you know they don't remember it you know what i mean like yeah like it's a big maybe you know what I mean? Like, and it's like you have to be paying attention and looking for it if you want it, anyways. But there's also no maps in those books, um, and so uh, and. But I was wondering because looking at this map, I was like, this doesn't really look vaguely like Earth unless I'm looking at it all wrong. And that's actually the map behind these. Yeah, for those watching, right. this, the map back here, you can't really see it. Kish is where that H is in between, right? Um, our between thing. our images. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Um, so I was just curious. Really. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the map 
that I drew is not at all based on Earth. So you have to imagine that it's far enough in the future that continents have moved, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or new continents have arisen uh, or whatever. Like I said, I don't think I will have them discover Earth artifacts you and I will recognize. I do in my kind of secret heart i guess this is non-canonical because i don't plan to ever write this down but i think of kish as being london um in a in a slightly warmer period uh because it doesn't really snow they, they just get kind of a cool winter uh and then a, then a hot muggy uh kind of summer um maybe in so i've lived in london for mm -hmm. basically I mean, I lived in England for five years in and around London and lived in New York. Kish is a city like those places. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm really just thinking about them as like, you know, big multi-ethnic, dirty, corrupt metropolis. But if Kish is a real place on earth, it's future London. That's awesome. I, uh, you know, I love, uh, I love Dying Earth. The first Dying Earth book I read was The Dying Earth by Jack Vance. Um, oh, yeah. That was just a little over a year ago. And since then, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, um, I mean, I kind of like the idea in the first place, kind of because uh, um, it's not a Dying Earth setting, but it's a similar idea with uh, The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, mm -hmm. where it's the future on mm -hmm. Earth, essentially, um, but just a couple of ages in the future. And the only like real hint, because the previous age was not really recognizable to us, um, so like the only really hint you get is that the, at one point in like a museum or like in some palace, there's a, a, a skeleton of a giraffe, giraffe, you know, and they don't call it a giraffe because I don't know what a giraffe is. And then like yeah. a symbol of hubris, which is the Mercedes Benz logo, you know, and it's just like, and he just has to describe what the Mercedes Benz logo looks like. Right. So um, I like stuff like that, you know, and I have uh, for a while, I guess. But uh, so be funny. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. You know, the Shinara books are in Earth, too. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It's like post-apocalyptic almost. Well, wait after that apocalypse, I imagine. But Yeah, which I think he decided. I don't know for sure. I think he decided later because the first three books don't feel at all like they're post-apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then he wrote, um, what is it? The Word in the Void trilogy, which I'm forgetting yeah. the title as well, but there's like. They're basically in, in a like, kind of an urban fantasy story. It, yeah, it's like Angel Fire East is one of them or something like that. Or Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, they take place in like the, Illinois or something. The, the Gypsy Moth maybe is one <laughs> of those three books. Um, it's sort of the bridge and it's like says, oh, no, no, it's, this is Earth. Magic was here all along. Then mm -hmm. we have something like a nuclear apocalypse and magic we, magic comes back. Yeah. yeah, which is pretty interesting. I I do mean to get to more Shannara. And I actually read once that... Uh, the Janai books later on, he decided he wanted to, to be a post apocalyptic earth as well. Oh, um, and because of like in legend, you don't see like any of it, but um, in uh, the King Beyond the Gates, he mentions the elders for the first time, which aren't mentioned in the first book. And uh, Interesting. They, they vaguely just seem like they're like some scientifically advanced people that, and apparently, or, or you know, it's on our planet, apparently. So I don't know if you've read much Gimel or whatever. And I, those are the only two books I've read by Gimel, actually. But I, I have not read those. No, I have read Dying Earth. Uh, I love Book of the New Sun, where I recently reread it. And then also the sort of book five, which is called Book of the New Earth. Earth I need to read U R T H. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, New Earth gets weird. I mean, if you thought books one through four were weird, like he's in a ship flying uh, through space, and then he's clearly back and forth and in time as well. Not weird, bad, just, you know, it's out there. That's good. No, yeah, I hear I hear it's different, uh, even compared to the first four. And it's, it's funny because after, I haven't, this is the first Wolf I ever read. And after I finished The Citadel of the Autark, I went and I read the map and the cats which are in his short story collection endangered species it's like these read very differently than severian does i was like i didn't realize how like you know specific like a style he had to get into to write severian yeah. you know because i hadn't read anything else by wolf um you know even though even though it's the same setting you know it's just not severian as the character in those two stories right. so it's pretty interesting uh but uh yeah so yeah, um there, I actually heard once uh, Christopher Raphael mentioned, and uh, I would like to see this if there's ever a chance. I know you're both you're supposed to be both at Fanex. Uh, is that 
maybe. Are you going to be going uh, to Probably. Or... Um, okay. And I don't know. He may or may not come to Dragon Con, too. Uh, okay. I hope he comes to Fanex. I live here, so he is welcome. Yeah. Today. I officially publicly issue my invitation to Christopher Rocky to stay at my house for Fanex. Um, <laughs> he, he already knows. I think. I think... <laughs> okay. So, so if he doesn't, if he doesn't go, it's his fault. Right. That's that's yeah. where we're at. Oh yeah. yeah um, absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I heard mention uh, a Ball Danders and Doctor Talos. Um, oh, cosplay fun. once that I would I would like to see that you, you're that pretty tall fun. aren't you right I, so, uh, six foot seven okay, yeah, yeah you're so pretty, you're definitely pretty tall you're definitely yeah. pretty. <laughs> that's funny uh no one would get it <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah I understand you feel like two people go I mean especially at a at a com con right I mean if you went to something like uh -huh. world con people there, mm -hmm. there are some people who would say oh Gene Wolf right but Comic Con, man, people are there to see like Thanos and uh, yeah. Superman, right? Uh, but I would still be down for it. I think that's a cool idea. <laughs> I would. I just want pictures. Is all if it happens. Um, but uh, <laughs> so, anyways, I, I would. Fanex is something I'd like to go to. Actually, it's funny. Um, just this is kind of off topic, but uh, um, since I'm up in Idaho right now, right, so it's relatively close. Yeah. Short and, drive. Uh, yeah, but it's funny because I'm uh I don't really stay these days, I don't really stay connected with any sports. But um I've never made mention of this on my channel before. But I, I do watch Halo esports, you know, the video okay. game Halo. Sure. I do enjoy that from time to time. Halo's been a favorite of mine for a really long time. Um and so I watched that and there's a I was thinking about going to where their Orlando like major at the same time, it's literally the same weekend. I was like, gosh dang it. So because my brother lives over in Orlando. And so I was just like, oh, I don't know. So we'll see what happens there. Um, one of them is definitely cheaper than the other, you know, because it's closer. Um, but yeah. uh, so um, it's probably easier to, I mean, I think the tickets are on sale now. So I'd, I probably need to make a decision um, because the, the Halo tickets, they don't go on sale until like a month beforehand and they sell out relatively quick. And so well, it's like, hey, <laughs> you are welcome to come stay at our house. Oh, okay. You probably have other people you could stay with, but you, you can you can probably. avoid a hotel. Uh, but also, uh, B, uh, you could probably email them and say, "Listen, I have this. I don't know if you call it a booktube channel, or I, I have this mm -hmm. channel. I'd like to be on programming. You might be able to get in with a with your badge comped." Hmm. That's an interesting idea. That's <laughs> I would think about that, and I would do it sooner rather than later because programming will fill up. But that's your, you know, there's there there's a risk as you're organizing this stuff. You're one of the organizers, right? Mm -hmm. Not you or I, but you abstract you uh, of bringing in the same old people. Yeah, so like hey, listen, I'm a, a channel. Here are some people I've interviewed in the past. Uh, I would love to come. I'd love to be on paneling to talk about how and why to do a YouTube channel. And I will also, you know, would want to record some interviews on your site. And I, I bet you can get your badge free. <laughs> so make the whole thing pretty cheap for you. Basically just be food. Sounds like a, a clever plan. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Sorry. you think about it. No pressure. I'm not trying to. No, listen. no, no, no. It's good. That's a, that's interesting. Esport. But you think about that. They are. They are <laughs> I'm not making it under duress. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Um, that's a that's funny. That makes me think of the. Uh, I am in school right now, and uh, as you are aware, but uh, um, it's like always funny because I was talking to my. Uh, I have to do an internship um, mm. that's related to my major. I've done an internship before, but it was more of just an opportunity I had, and I did it or whatever. Um, wasn't really done through school at all, and I was like. I, uh, I was like, I, I was like, maybe I could talk to like, because I was, I was talking to the guy I, has, I have to talk to for internships. And I was like, you know, I kind of want the idea of like, I'm, I'm not 100% set on what I want to do as like a career, right? You know, as of right now, I'm just working whatever jobs I have essentially or can do. Um, and so I'm just like, you know, it'd be cool to do this, 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 that, right? So like, I wanted to talk to the person that's in charge of special collections at my school library, for example, because I'm interested in codecology or, you know, and stuff like that. Um, but also it's like, you know, it'd be really cool to like intern as like an editor, 
you know, like even for like a small press somewhere, I was like, I wonder it, it'd be a lot easier if I could do it remotely, but there's a lot more opportunities for remotely these days. And I was like talking to my guy, I was like, you know, I'm going to have to reach out to some people <laughs> uh, soon actually. But uh, it's just like, it's just interesting. Cause it's like, it's weird um, because it's not like something that comes to mind almost. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? Like you mentioned that idea. I was like, that like me is like that's coming from way over here man i was like uh <laughs> and so it was similar with like this this thing i was like i just i don't know i just work my uh, my crappy jobs that's what i do <laughs> so uh, well bain does do does have interns and mm-hmm. um i don't know the terms of them right um but uh uh but let's talk and and if not Bain, I know a lot of small publishers that I can hook mm-hmm. you up with um, in Utah and in Idaho, but also in Tennessee and North Carolina. Um, so uh, I think there were probably lots of opportunities. Yeah, I've uh, just been. Uh, I start school again tomorrow for my next semester because my school does trimesters. All right. You know um so it's kind of weird and so i was like thinking i gotta get on the ball this semester because uh technically i need to be doing my internship like august forward from that because i don't i don't go to school in september that semester um so but yeah so anyways uh th- but cool yeah we should talk yeah <laughs> so <laughs> i don't want to talk about that here now i guess but um yeah, we can but I, we are recording <laughs> you'd rather not i don't know whatever whatever okay. you want no, that's good. No, that's good. It's just what maybe came to mind. But um, I I did, for, before we get too far away from Abbott and Darkness, I did want to say that it's not out yet, but it does come out. I think it's, is it May 3rd? Yeah, um, it's something like that. It's real soon. Okay, um, is that, is that Bane as well? Is that a Bane? That is also Bane. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. So for those interested, uh, May 3rd, um, I sh- my, my review, like I mentioned earlier, should should probably be up i I think i was looking i do my reviews generally on mondays and fridays uh so like tomorrow for example i have my swords against wizardry review uh coming out and uh on this friday i think i'll probably have house of sons by alistair reynolds but uh monday a week from tomorrow it will probably be uh abbott and darkness so very cool very cool thank you yeah, I uh, no, no, it was great. Thank you uh, for sending me the, the digital copy. Um, after that, it'll probably be this book, which I'm not done yet with. But Gate of Iberal by C.J. Cherry. Don't know if you've ever read any Cherry. Um, I but... think I, I have read some. I don't remember that one specifically. But it, if I did read it, it would have been in like in the 80s. So no, oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's quite a while ago. Uh, that's going <laughs> <laughs> in a year or two. <laughs> no, I think this is Cherry's actually first novel, but uh, it's like a science fantasy type of thing, kind of Elric, Elric like feel. She's got white hair; it's very melancholy, and uh, it does a lot of people die Elric. around her. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, there's that though. Um, <clears throat> actually, there was I don't remember. It was called. You have another book um, besides the ones we've already talked about, uh, right? You you have several. Down, down the pipeline um was it time trials is that what it was oh yeah uh mike rothman ma rothman is a uh best-selling indie author who writes kind of techno thriller but mm-hmm. also kind of thriller and kind of some fantasy stuff and uh one of the things i need to start as soon as next week is i need to do the edit on that book which should be coming out from bain in the um there, there are three seasons in publishing. The spring season goes January to April in traditional publishing. Uh-huh. Indy does whatever it wants. But from January to April is the spring season. Okay. It's sure about sometime. So about, you know, nine to 12 months from now, uh, that should come out. Uh-huh. Uh, and we've got a cover already. And been, if you follow Mike, especially, he shared that several times on social media. Uh, I've probably shared it to my list. What was his name again? Mike uh, Rothman. R O T H M A N. Cool. Yeah, I will. That. That's interesting. Hey, right. um, <laughs> and that's a techno thriller. I I've heard the techno thriller only a little bit, and that I've heard it, it applied to Jurassic Park. That's a good um, example. Yeah, Michael Crichton or Tom Clancy. Mike kind of sees himself a little bit in that vein. 
this is only a little bit kind of the opening is a little bit like a like a Crichton book or something. It, it's mm -hmm. really about an archaeological team on a private dig um, that uh this is oversimplification but basically they dig up a time machine and it sends them back into fourth millennium bc oh. so they're like at the dawn of ancient egypt uh and it's about them sort of which turns out to be dominated by monsters <laughs> that's so it's about them kind of taking the side of humanity against the monsters that are oppressing them uh mm -hmm. and um uh yeah that's book one it is a series. Not sure how far it'll go. We'll kind of see how the book is received. But uh, it is also uh, very lightly game lit. Oh. So there is uh, um, there are sort of indications that the the characters, as they are in this prehistoric or proto historic earth. Are in some sense living in like a D and D world, like they they do things and level up and gain abilities. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Have I've never written game, game lit before. Mike has. It's like okay. a huge thing. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, it sounds interesting. I mean, I imagine it'd probably be well received too. But I mean. <laughs> I look forward to reading it at least whenever it does come out. But um, well, thank you. Fingers crossed. That, that is interesting for sure. Um, it's funny what my brain gets stuck up on it because you said it was. It's like essentially ruled by monsters, and I'm just sitting here trying to think of this phrase. It's like, what is this phrase? <laughs> it's. A, I read it once in a Tom Shippey article. Um, oh, interesting. Like about Tolkien. Yeah. Well, the article itself wasn't actually about Tolkien, but yeah, he does most of his stuff about Tolkien or a lot of his stuff about Tolkien. And uh, it was about... So interesting. So why are you reading Tom Shippey? Do you study like Anglo-Saxon literature or something? Yeah, I study philology uh, mostly on my own these days. Um, Very cool. Because of, because of Tolkien, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, it was a, it was an article. Okay. It was on academia.edu. Um, I don't know where it was originally published, but it was about... Um, Merovingians in Beowulf, essentially. Um, right. There is a line, I don't even remember. I don't remember much about it, but there is a line somewhere in Beowulf that's like, I think it's three words as the manuscript stands. Um, and he was essentially saying it should be amended to Merovingian, you know, because this person writing it or writing this copy of Beowulf in, you know, 10th, 11th century wouldn't know who the Merovingians were because um, they were gone. It, it well, was, yeah, and who was it? Was the French kings Capetians? anyway? Yeah, was it the Capetian? Yeah, or it was Louis after Capet. them. Yeah, that they would have. Uh, they they practice this phrase that I can't remember, where they basically try to erase the previous ruling people. Oh, um, yeah. Like like, uh, and it made me think of Egypt because the high goes, and some people say that that similar thing probably happened to them. And um, uh, yeah, and also, um, uh. Oh, what's her name? One of, one of the great women pharaohs, um, whose son basically tried to obliterate her out of the monuments. Uh, I feel dumb for not remembering her name, but yes, this is a uh, an old practice. You try and wipe the record clean of your predecessor, or tar a... and feather him. Yeah, <laughs> yes, right? you can't have that uh, conflict to your you know your divine right or whatever you want to call it. So, um, right. which is which is interesting. interesting. This, this is in the Old Testament, too, where I think there's mm -hmm. reason, we have reason to think that some of the names that are idolatrous names of, mm -hmm. of kings who are described as being wicked are actually doctored versions of their name where, where like a Yahweh element has been substituted with a Baal element to make that guy bad. He was bad. I am the good guy. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you gotta love it right humans are rather petty huh um but uh, <laughs> not much has changed um yep. sadly uh but uh <laughs> which is why this it's funny though it's another thought again kind of random um my brain goes um but uh that's what we've had like late maybe six thousand years of human history which is why another thing i like the dying earth because it's so like uncomprehensible you know i mean like millions of years at least you know in the future sometimes i it could easily be billions or whatever right and so it's just like how do you and, you don't comprehend that i don't comprehend it. i mean millions yeah. of years ago there was dinosaurs or whatever right so it's just like right 
and uh well even even that's true of the of the of the new son too but like in there's that series it's the last book in the i forget what it's called it's the last book of the dying earth novels where these wizards are trying to um i can't remember what they're trying to find but they're like chasing it through time so there's like a sequence where like the servant uh drops that's like a button or something beneath the waves and the wizard's like fine stand there don't move i'm going to come back when this sea has evaporated and then goes <laughs> forward in time like a million years right to so find the servant still standing there now he's on like a dune and then the, and the wizard then digs for uh whatever it is the <laughs> MacGuffin they're chasing uh yeah it's fantastic man Vance. Anyways, I, I haven't read that one yet. Is that is it Rialto the Marvelous? Probably. I think then? that's it. That sounds yeah. Right. I need to get to that. Like, the first one is short stories, and then there's two that are basically like the same guy. He's that kind of yeah, Kugel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, like picaresque or whatever. You call it is him. A, and that's an actual picaresque as opposed to being like, oh, I don't have a plot for my novel. I shall call it a picaresque uh, to sound important. An actual, <laughs> he's like just kind of yes, wandering around, and and it's like reading. It's almost like little folk tales, you know. It's always uh -huh. about this guy who's he's not really admirable. He's sort of bad. No, no uh, not at all. <laughs> but, like he outwits the people who are trying to outwit him. It's mm -hmm. kind of yeah the constant theme. Uh and then yeah, Rialto, that's what it is. And he's yeah, chasing I forget what object through time. That's funny. Yeah, it's a it's interesting because like, yeah, he's not a he's not a good guy. He's entertaining. I think he's entertaining. Uh um Google. Um, it's interesting though because then you contrast him with something like Severian, who makes you right. feel like he's a great person sometimes, and other times he's like the most horrible person ever. You know, it's just like, right. which is pretty interesting that Wolf is able to do that so well. But, um, right. but it's it's interesting because I've I've read so I've read the Dying Earth, I've read or the Eyes of the Overworld, right? So the first Kugel story, I've read a Quest for Symbolus, which is the Michael Shea Kugel story, oh, like two point five. Um, okay. It is authorized, right? Jack Vance said he could write it. This is in the 70s, I think. Um, and then the next one, those Kugel Saga, which acts like the Quest for Symbolist didn't happen. Um, because, like, a Quest for Symbolist starts off right where um, the Eyes of the World ends, but so does Kugel Saga. That's so, funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I need to get to Kugel Saga soon. Um, and then Rialto the Marvelous. Uh, it's funny because sometimes the Kugel stories don't land with people. Like, I've right. seen multiple people, like, oh, I like The Dying Earth, and I like Rialto the Marvelous, but I didn't care for the, the middle two books, like, at all. <laughs> so, and... Uh, and that's definitely... why, right? He's he's fundamentally not sympathetic. He, yeah. Like, like, he doesn't do any of the things that we... Um, well, the one thing he does is he's clever, and maybe the mm -hmm. people he is defeating are sometimes worse than him, right? But he, he's not really yeah. kind. <laughs> you don't see him saving anybody uh right uh he's not really necessarily heroic so like a lot of the things where we nope. we ordinarily expect a protagonist to do or to be to get our sympathy he is not he is not yeah which which is to me it's it's nice and you know, it's like kind of like a change of pace right because like i mean the the those books i mean like uh book of the new sun is just like obtuse as heck i mean if you wanted to call it that way i mean like it's just but that's fine you know what i mean like in my mind it's just like i don't need to read something that like oh it's just nice and cozy and tropey and you know and i love the main character he's so awesome uh you know i don't need to read something like that all the time i do like reading stuff like that don't get me wrong that's what i'd say i read most of the time anyways uh, and that's what's mostly written <laughs> probably anyways so um Right. So like I wouldn't bash John Abbott, for example. Right. I mean, like he, he fits into that second one and that's fine. Right. But it's just like it's nice to read about Kugel sometimes because he's just such a dastard. And it's just like yeah. and he's clever. And this the world he's in is like so bizarre, you know, so it's just like, yeah. why not read it? Why, why, why wouldn't I you know, get a different taste of something, you know? So. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, it's got it's got a kind of a charm and lightness to it. Uh, Severian's very heavy. I I read it mm -hmm. twice. Um, the second time, A was easier to follow because I'd read it before. But also B, I started looking words up. I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, I'm gonna look all these things up. I I know some Greek anyway, so that helped. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm gonna everything. And then you start realizing that he's actually making up very few of these words. They're yeah, they are Greek or Latin. Like I remember, uh, so early on, he's at the 
the what is it the Madachin Tower and uh, he talks about thylacodons crawling over the garbage or something. You look it up. Well, what it means is opossums. Oh. Uh, or or maybe technically it's an extinct cousin of the opossum, right? That's what huh. it's talking about. So so actually, I did not do this in Palace, but in the short stories and especially the novella and the sequel, I systematically grabbed a bunch of. Um, so if you look at like the at like the tr the plants that mm -hmm. are in the first book, they're actually mostly from India. They're things you might oh. encounter in India. But I started mixing in in the short story and in the sequels um, uh, species from the dying earth and from Book of the New Sun, uh, the uh, the Mirhadian and the bottle uh, uh, the bottle yew and the thamber oak and uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Which I think most people are whatever. It's a tree, right? Is that <laughs> won't know that the thamber oak isn't a real thing or whatever anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, a, it's a very serious, right? So uh, it's like there's a there's an Orson Scott card story. Um, oh man, I for I forget what it is uh, called. It's old, like maybe the seventies. And it's about this. It's about this guy, who um, it's a science fiction story, and he sort of systematically maims people. But what it's really about is a very, very sort of heavy take on the idea of Jesus, hmm. and like you know, we look at someone and we may say, "Oh, that person is you know stranger." doesn't fit or whatever but like but maybe that person has been made perfect by jesus and it's mm -hmm. in a way we that we don't we don't understand or respond to so it's like very like dark and heavy and very serious and like there's no humor in it and that's you know there there is humor in book of the new sun but like that's not what it principally is it's not there to right. charm you or delight you right it's there to challenge you and push you to think about stuff uh-huh which which is pretty interesting because i got that's one of the reasons i i can't say i understand a lot about what happened in book of the new sun uh but it's made me think more than any other book i've read probably in the past two years or so um yeah. you know i just i at some point during the day generally i still like hmm let me think about that for a second because like it just comes in my mind because it's just it's very interesting uh it's very uh but I mean, there's other things I like about Book of the New Sun, right? Like I like his, I like his taking of these words and just like shoving them in there. And because he, I, mean, I think he, right, obviously he went out of his way to make sure these were real words in a sense. They might not have been English originally right. um, or something. Um, and it's yeah. funny because I, I did look up some of the words while I was originally reading through it. At some point I just stopped and I was like, you know, whatever, right. I'll figure out what these words mean later um, or by context or whatever. And uh, it's just... Some of them you can't even find stuff for online. I, I got the lexicon Earthist so I could oh, right. understand if I wanted to. Um, but I, I like I like the idea, right? Like, because I like it's like they're words. You know I mean, like, yeah, he uses them for his world building. And it's very effective, you know. But it's just like, but they're words. You know what I mean? So it's just like there's my mind is like I'm gonna use this if I want to. You know what I mean? Like I wrote a short story. What's well, actually not finished? I have several. Of them. I'm in the middle of, but like I was writing a short story the other day and I just put Madam in there, right? Obviously took that from Tolkien, but he took it from Old English. So like, well, why right. can't I use it? Uh, you know, it's just like, and, uh, or like I was writing a Dying Earth story, another one that's not finished. So I, I don't know why I say this, but I like the practice of it. I do it in my poetry too. But, you know, I put like my, uh, I put someone, I called him an epigenarian, you know, they're basically someone who's of Eros, right? Of the Dawn or whatever. I think it's Eros, right? I think, I don't know, whatever, you know, and that's generally my idea of, you know, uh, Rocchio put his, uh, he calls them Nipponese, I think, in his Senator book. And I was like, they're basically somewhat like Japanese people, but way far in the future. You know what I mean? So like, no. and I thought Nipponese was too obvious. You know, they're they're less related. So I'm going to make up this new word that I just took from Greek or whatever. Or like I called the dwarf a nanion. You know, I was yeah. like, oh, that's probably been done before. You know, whatever. You know, yeah. but it's like, it's still nice. I like the spirit of it. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, that's why I I do that a lot actually. With which is probably why a lot of people don't. It's funny. Like I try. The only person who ever reads my writing is really my dad. 
Yeah. And it's probably why he's the only person who reads it because the other people are like, what the heck? You're like, why did you use that word? It's like, you didn't need to say a carnifex. You know, you could have just said a torturer, like executioner, executioner rather, I guess. But uh, so anyways, but it's fun. I don't know. That's what I like. I like words. Um, so <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I... Um... I don't know. Maybe maybe rooting your book solidly in um, sort of the antiquity of the language. Maybe maybe that will help it have legs, right? I think that's a those are way better roots to use. They're durable. Those words have been around for a long time. They're still around, mm -hmm. right? People don't say don't immediately they don't say carnifex all the time. It's still say carnivore. Yeah. It doesn't take, it's not much of a step, right? To, to recognize the connection. Someone who makes meat, someone who turns yeah. people into meat. Or you could say carne asada. <laughs> or carne a lot of people know what that is. <laughs> still there. I think that's a much, I think there are much more ephemeral things people try to root their um, mm -hmm. stories in. Nassim Talib kind of makes this argument in, in the book Anti Fragile. He says, you know, as a rough rule of thumb, things that are new and recent, we have no guarantee they, they'll survive. Uh, you know, if you had to make a mm -hmm. bet, what's going to be around 500 years from now, a table or an iPad? You say a table. We're going to have tables 500 years from now because you know, <laughs> we've had them for 5,000. They serve the job really, really well. They do exactly what they need to. They're cheap. They're effective. You can move them. We're going to have a table in 500 years. Will we have an iPad? Man, I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. Don't know. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. Picking picking old roots like that, I think, may be a way to make your storytelling robust to change. It's rooted. You know, <laughs> well, it's all these stories about social media may be meaningless uh -huh. in years. Right. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it's interesting that um, my uh, I had a teacher last semester who talked about that kind of. It's like even if you're making a modern movie. Is like you, he was of the opinion that you should never say like, oh, they're streaming on Twitch, you know, what I mean, in their modern movie, because it's like that doesn't belong in that like diegetic world, essentially. I mean, it's just like that's this, that's here now, it's our world. Don't put it in there, um, essentially. And uh, even, but even like Tolkien or uh, Lovecraft, which have only gotten more popular since their deaths, um, are rather archaic, you know, in in some ways, as far as vocabulary goes. Um, I don't say they're extremely. Last um, time but... I read Tolkien was like two years ago, and I, st I still learned a new word. Right, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what's an ayat? And it turns out it's a little island in a stream. And he used it right there in Fellowship yeah. of the Ring. And the first 20 times I read it, I didn't notice the word. There I remember there. looking that one up last time I read it, too. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like when I read uh, Lovecraft a couple months ago, I was like, Nathandis, what does this mean? <laughs> And then use it in my own writing because why not? So um, uh, it's just like you said, uh, was it uh, Christomathy or whatever? You know, I was like, oh yeah. man, I'm going to use that. I used Palimpsest actually before. I used it in a sneaking story. I was imitating Wolf and uh, Rocchio. And I was like, Palimpsest is like, you awesome. don't know what that word is? I guess they can look it up. Um, so, um, but it fit. You know, it fit what I was trying to say. Um, cool. And, uh, you know, I think you actually do a really good job of. Um, you know, words not they they can't they do in some senses they give it the feel you want. You know, what I mean, like Wolf uses them really well um, in Book of the New Sun for that like weird otherworldly like feel kind of. Um, but like in your witchy books, honestly, I can't say like I I in the past I've written a lot of what I would call fan fiction, mm -hmm. and I liked it because it was fun to it was a challenge and it was like. I got to get this lore right. You know what I mean? Like I'd write like Forgotten Realms fan fiction and mm. there's tons of it, like tons and tons. Like it's unimaginable how much there is. I was like, I can't miss it. I can't miss it like a piece of it. You know what I mean? So it was fun writing in Forgotten Realms, you know, it, they don't publish anything basically these days. So I couldn't do anything with it. Um, but uh, it was a fun challenge and you, historical fiction is seems somewhat like that. Cause I did write that one historical fantasy book, you know, and I didn't do a ton, but I like, I had to get my timeline at least a little a little down for what I wanted going on in the story a little bit. And uh, I can only imagine 
I mean, wait, there's, isn't there, uh, there's, there's Native American languages in, oh, yeah. in which he wore, and I'm just like, I don't, I don't even know where I'd go to, to learn that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah, you could sure you could grab the French and the Dutch and the, and the German or whatever, you know, and make that somewhat accurate. You know what I mean? But like the, yeah. even the, it's just I don't know. The attention to detail is rather impressive. The world building seems so. I don't want to call it anal, but it's just like, it's just like, I can only imagine. Uh, yeah. yeah I really, I really care about America is the thing. And I really, mm -hmm. you know, like Tolkien is, um, Tolkien's epic. Fundamentally, the Lord of the Rings is English. And it, yeah. it fundamentally it is a story all about England and finding a, a pre mythology a Christian prehistory, a Christian pre-mythology for England and, and, and looking at England, which is a smallish, place i mean it's big mm -hmm. enough it's like a big yeah. u.s state but you know <laughs> um look it has layers of occupation and it has mm -hmm. lost cities and it has mysteries well <laughs> guess what if you blow that up to the size of north america there is so much more and we and we have and are still learning all the time uh about huge lost civilizations like the hopewell uh and um and we had tons of ruins mostly our farmers mm -hmm. plowed them down when we got here yeah. you know but, but now we're starting to do things like use ground using lidar ground penetrating lidar to go through and like recover some of these things that are lying underneath cities and and forests and and, and we have you know we have records of 17 algonquian languages that were spoken in north america some of them we don't know what the name was we just have like a list some dutch guy would be like here are the words i used to talk to this tribe and then there's like you know a list of 20 words but no one ever found them again like they mm -hmm. disappeared they got wiped out by smallpox or something right so it's just america is huge and epic and amazing um and any anything any any attempt i can make to engage with it on that kind of tolkien level is is doomed to failure so uh, uh it's too big all i can do yeah. is, is try uh and and i love trying it's it is a lot of fun and, yeah. and there are all these cool you just find all these cool little connections um the more you kind of read the more you kind of dig yeah no it's a it's definitely cool to read um for i mean like i was an anthropology major for a while and my mm -hmm. teacher was a southwest anthropologist specifically but you know we went over a lot of that like paleo indian and other stuff like that i've been to cahokia i'm from illinois um actually Very cool. uh, so but it's and it's nice to see cahokia alive you know what i mean in the book you know what i mean because uh, yeah. it's not it's not sorry i was like the only person there when i went there <laughs> you know like so uh and it's just a big cool mound there are, well several big cool mounds but you know yeah but definitely dead um you know so it's right uh, which is sad so uh so i uh i admire the efforts uh, but not just that i admire it i thought i think it's really well done i think it's really well executed and uh, i'm really enjoying um serpent daughter so uh hopefully I'll, I'll probably get through that this week but so thank you that's my rest of the year once i get these four like finalized things off my desk you know write book five and book six back to back and, nice. uh, and finish it up yeah is it just going to be those six i know there was the first one the soft trilogy kind of and then the yeah second one. that's that's the plan now like if there's a movie deal and suddenly it goes haywire i think tony will say well what else do you want to write and that's very reasonable would be very reasonable <laughs> so you know that may happen if it ever went that way i think i would might want to go back and write like a prequel trilogy about uh uh john churchill for example yeah, I uh, about a uh, like I haven't actually. It's funny. I'm in the middle of both, and I know one's way shorter, but Day Brit Britannici or whatever it is, um, which is pretty interesting so far. Uh, yeah. So, um, I was trying to read it before I talked to you actually, and then I didn't. I was uh, helping with the family, so. Um, but <laughs> as you must do, that's important work. I yes, I agree. No. <laughs> but uh, it is it is about time for us to, to end here, though. But uh, you know, it's. Thanks. Thanks for coming on and talking. And, uh, you know, um, this, the third person I've talked to, the second author I've talked to, I definitely will be having more people on the show. But um, if you ever want to come back on, then feel free. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I'm sure I'll talk to you a, a, a later night at some other point anyways. But <laughs> Thanks but, very yeah. much for having me, Liam. I look forward to it. It'll be fun. We'll talk again. Yeah. So, again, this is 
he's on the site. I guess he's DJ Butler, uh, author of uh, Witchy War, starting with Witchy Eye, and then in Palace Shadow and Joy, we got The Cunning Man down there, written with Aaron Michael Orchie, and then uh, Avid in Darkness uh, as well comes out May 3rd, so if anyone is interested there. So anyways, this has been uh, Liam with Liam's Lyceum, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you.